Hello, everyone, and welcome to Friday. It is April 2nd, and this is Good Friday. I hope you will be able to join us at our West, uh, I'm sorry, our East Campus for our Good Friday service, 1501 Franklin. Um, that will take place 7 o'clock this evening. So uh, I think you will be blessed having uh, come and been a part of that. So I think all of these services, if for some reason or another you are unable to physically attend or you don't quite feel safe yet, still waiting on vaccinations or whatever, it can be done uh, online as well. So um, we are going to go ahead and get started now with this um, this episode of Lunchtime with Pastor Shane, which will be our last. Uh, we committed to doing this during the Lent season, and uh, that is coming to an end. And so uh, we will take a break from this. And uh, just a lot of stuff going on coming up with uh, my son getting married. I've got graduation from seminary going on. And uh, these things take a little time uh, to put together. It also uh, causes uh, Crystal to have to do extra time uh, to get these uh, uploaded where they need to go. And so we're going to break from it, but uh, it doesn't mean you have to. You may continue to do this, and I will continue to do it. I just won't be going through this uh, whole recording stuff because uh, it always takes a while to down, you know, convert the video, and then it has to be downloaded and then uploaded and uh, spend much time sitting and waiting for all of that uh, to take place. But I've enjoyed it, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. I know it's been a blessing to me. And uh, if we do not get it uh, started again at some point the rest of this year, we will certainly do it again next Lenten season. So be looking forward to them, but there's no reason for you uh, not to be able to continue to do it on your own. Well, we're going to start once again with World's Collection of... Uh, greatest collection of church jokes and so here is one that I wanted to start with when brother Martin died and went to heaven he was met at the front gate by Saint Peter who let him know that he needed 100 points to make it in the pearly gates you tell me all the good things you've done and I'll give you points according to your deeds when you reach 100 I'll swing open the gates okay brother Martin reported I was head usher at First Baptist for 50 years that's wonderful, says St. Peter. That's worth two points. I was married to the same woman for almost 65 years and never cheated on her. Remarkable, Peter declared. Here are three more points. Only three? How about this? I started a soup kitchen in the inner city and worked in a homeless shell shelter. Terrific, said St. Peter, and here are two more points. Well, Ted's eyes opened wide and he yelled, two points? At this rate, the only way I'll get into heaven is by the grace of God. Come on in, said St. Peter. <laughs> that is how we all get into heaven, is simply by the grace of God, not by works, not by a point system. Thank God for that. Well, as we uh, move into uh, our last time here together today uh, for a while, uh, once again, you if you've been joining us this week, you know that uh, we are reading. Uh, the psalm for this week is Psalm 23. And so I have chosen a different translation called the Passion Translation. And here's uh, how it is uh, titled, The Good Shepherd, David's Poetic Praise to God. Here's how it reads. Yahweh is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace near the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me the right path and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me, for you already have. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely, for you are near. You become my delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my cup overflows. So why would I fear the future? Only goodness and tender love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterward, 
when my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. Those are some, uh, it's a great psalm, one that has been uh, much comfort to many people over the generations. Well, our uh, scripture reading for Friday, for today, this Good Friday, is a long one. Uh, we're going to read both John chapter 18 and John chapter 19. So you might want to turn there to John chapter 18. I'm going to re be reading from the New Living Translation. This is where Jesus is betrayed and arrested. We get Peter's first denial. We get the high priest questioning Jesus. Uh, Peter's second and third denials. Jesus' trial before Pilate. Uh, and then uh, Jesus sentenced to death. So it's really given us the whole, and the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. And so it's given, given this whole story right up through Jesus's burial from the time of his betrayal up through his burial. So <clears throat> on this uh, Good Friday, let's settle in and hear these words uh, of scripture. John 18. After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? he asked. Jesus, the Nazarene they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more he asked them, who are you looking for? And again they replied, Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Mal Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their commanding officer, and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. First they took him to Annas, since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at that time. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, it's better that one man should die for the people. Simon P Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. Jesus replied, everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogues and the temple where the people gather. I have not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest? He demanded. Jesus replied, If I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, why are you beating me? Then Annas bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire warming himself, they asked him again, You're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, No, I am not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? And again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. 
So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, Is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, So you are a king. Jesus responded, You say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, He is not guilty of any crime, but you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, No, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Look, here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, by our law, he ought to die because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Then Jesus said, You would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leaders shouted, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was now about noon on the day of preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, Look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him. Crucify him. What? Crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, so that many people could read it. Then the leading priests objected and said to Pilate, Change it from the king of the Jews to he said I am king of the Jews. Pilate replied, No, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, Rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, They divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, 
the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it, in on, a, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It was the day of preparation. The Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath, and a very special Sabbath because it was Passover week. So they asked Pilate to hasten their deaths by ordering that their legs be broken. Then their bodies could be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you also may continue to believe. These things happen in fulfillment of the scriptures that say, not one of his bones will be broken, and they will look on the one they pierced. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following G Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices and long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Well, that was a long reading, but that's, uh, that's the story of this uh, Good Friday. And so uh, it was good to read it in its entirety um, as we kind of relive uh, that story all over again. Well, we come now th to our reading for reflection, which comes from uh, Letters from the Desert by Carlo Corretto. This is what he writes. Astonishing. The Son of God, who more than anyone else, was free to choose what he would, chose not only a mother and a people, but also a social position. And he wanted to be a wage earner. That Jesus had voluntarily lost himself in an obscure Middle Eastern village, annihilated himself in the daily monotony of 30 years, rough, miserable work, separated himself from the society that counts, and died in total anonymity. So the fullness uh, of the divine in the fullness of humanity. Well, as we go once more uh, into this prayer time, uh, lift up whatever is on your heart, mind, and soul, and then I'll close this out. Lord, we have so loved this time together. We know that we're better together. It is easier, an easier task to commit to something like this and to stay committed. So while we break now for a while, it may, it won't be forever. And while we break from it together, it doesn't mean that we cannot continue to do it in community. For what we are really doing is, uh, is carving out a time to be in community with you, to commune with your Holy Spirit as it speaks to our spirit. So Lord, we have had a blessed time doing this and we will continue to do so in our daily devotion time. Lord, we lift up all of those uh, joys and praises, uh, and in everything, may you be the one that uh, gets the, all the honor and the glory. And we lift up our concerns and our grief and our brokenness, and pray that your Holy Spirit uh, power would bring the transformation to each of our lives that we so need, in whatever aspect of our being that we need it. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, the uh, hymn has been The Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want, but it is a Scottish Psalter. And so here's Friday's verse. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. 
and in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. Amen. And again, is the Scottish Psalter. So uh, the Psalter, uh, little poem or hymn written after Psalm 23. So let me read the whole thing to you now since this is uh, Friday. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness, e'en for his own name's sake. Yea, though I walk in death's dark bell, yet will I fear no ill, for thou art with me, and thy rod and staff me comfort still. My table thou hast furnished in presence of my foes. My head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me, and in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. Amen. Well, if I had a Scottish accent, I could have read that in uh, that uh, accent, and uh, would have been uh, neat to do, but there you uh, have it. And so as we part now uh, and break from this for a while, I do hope and pray that you will continue this. Uh, it is one of the sweetest things that we can be doing. And one of the greatest spiritual disciplines is to carve out this alone time with God. But until we meet again together, begin to do this again, whether it's later this year, uh, after I get through all of this other stuff, uh, uh, this Holy Week, uh, Easter Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, my uh, little family gathering, wedding for my son, uh, my graduation from seminary, uh, getting uh, some new positions hired uh, for our church. You know, we're, uh, we've got two positions that we need to replace right now. Just really, really, really busy summer. And these take so much time to develop, produce, and get loaded, not only for myself, but for Crystal. And uh, she is uh, taking on the new job of office manager. And so we need to allow her time to be able to learn what she needs to learn there. And so, uh, if you would allow us this time, this break, we'll either join later in the fall as we start a new ministry year, or we'll simply wait till uh, the Lenten season next year and do it again. But again, you don't have to stop. I hope that you've developed this habit uh, while we have done this together uh, so that it continues on for you in your devotional time each day. And now hear this benediction from Numbers 6, 24 through 26 for the last time. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. You all have a blessed uh, week and a blessed Easter Sunday. I trust and hope that you will be able to uh, spend it with your family in some way, shape, or form. And we will uh, see you back at some point in the future. Blessings.